Namaste everyone. Good evening. This is Madhu Bhutiri on the last episode of Connecting the Dots, our um, season two webinar series from iCommerce India Cultural Tourism along with the, the National Scientific Committee of uh, uh, Historic Cities, Towns and Villages and also Intangible Cultural Heritage. So I welcome all of you. And uh, today, uh, as it's our last uh, session, um, I am privileged to introduce our uh, brilliant scholar, Dr. Ujwala Anand Palasule. Uh, she is a conservation architect and she has been in the field for last 20 years as a practitioner, researcher, and academician. She has a keen interest in architectural history and the traditional knowledge systems of India. Her research focuses on Southeast Asian architectural history with a special focus on Khmer architecture, Cambodia, and Dravidian temple architecture. Other than presenting papers at international and national conferences, she has also published a book on her research. She has founded Samrachna, HCRI Pune, a well-known organization. And then she is working as a principal of MMCOA Pune. Welcome, Dr. Rujulla. I'm honored to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank Let's you. uh, learn from Ujwala the beauty of Indian temples and how she's taking us to another country with the journey from India. Thank you. Thank you, Madhu. Good evening, everyone. I'll share my screen. I hope it is visible. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So today, uh, I'll be presenting the fifth session, Beyond India and Reflections. And the topic of my presentation is Celebrating Cultural Heritage, Traditional Festivals in Cambodia and India. At the outset, I would like to uh, thank Madhu and NSCs who have given me this opportunity to present uh, my work on this platform. So to start with, uh, uh, India uh, has connections with Southeast Asia since ancient times. So the first instance that we see is around uh, 5,000 years ago, where we see a lot of ports all across the Western and Eastern coast of India. And uh, there are various names given in the uh, book called The Periplus of Eritrean Sea, which uh, depicts a lot of uh, ports across the western uh, coast of India. And there are few names uh, given in the book, uh, which are on the eastern coast of India. Now, these connections were established because of the trade which was happening between India and China. And Cambodia and Southeast Asia being at the strategic location, they were connected through various sea routes, which were uh, from India to China. Now, this region historically is known as Farther India and also is um, uh, characterized as Indianization by Professor Codes. Now, before we move on to the uh, next uh, segment, uh, we all know that there is a huge movement of temple construction in India happening from 3rd century AD till around 15th century AD. Now, similarly, in Southeast Asia also, we see various temples which have uh, very evident Indian influence on them. Now, to have this influence, there is a very uh, important uh, period of civilization which was happening in Southeast Asia. And this period is known as Indianization period of Southeast Asia. It is also known as Sanskritization of Southeast Asia. Now, this Indianization term is being coined by Professor Kors in 1965, which also describes this concept as uh, the or it is an organized expansion of a culture that was formed upon Indian concepts of royalty, Hinduism, Buddhist cult, and Sanskrit language. Now, moving beyond this concept, there are various other aspects which were also being impacted or influenced from Indian uh, culture to Southeast Asian culture. So when we look at Cambodia in detail, we see that it is at a very strategic location and every uh, sea route that goes from India to China has to pass through Cambodia and the uh, coast of uh, Cambodia and Vietnam, current boundaries of Vietnam. And that's why there was a huge uh, progress and uh, uh, richness in this particular region because of its connection with both the countries. Uh, through this, we also see that during the period of Chola dynasty, uh, from say around 8th century till 13th century, there was huge uh, uh, prosperity in Dravida Desha as well as in the Khmer region or the Cambodian region. And uh, that's how we see the construction of uh, Tanjavur temple in, uh, in uh, Tanjavur, which is supposedly the largest temple and perfectly constructed temple in India. And because of the um, 
com commercial policies of Chola, there was huge transaction between India and Cambodia. And uh, there is a lot of prosperity uh, in Cambodia as well because of these connections. And eventually in 12th century, we see the construction of Angkor Wat temple in Cambodia in the region of Angkor or Siem Reap. Now with this, we also understand that this to reach up to this level of construction, there was a huge process of evolution that was happening from 1st century till uh, 12th century AD. So uh, apart from the architectural references, there are some uh, cultural references that we can take from both the regions. And uh, the next uh, segment of my presentation is about references of traditional festivals in temples. So when we look at this history of Cambodia, there are four major, major uh, phases of the uh, uh, history. So the first phase is known as Funan period, or this is also known as Indianization of Cambodia. Uh, so this is the period when most of the uh, civilization was developing based on the in Indian concepts of uh, culture. Then comes the Shenla period, wherein we see uh, development of temples, uh, development of a lot of uh, length, the uh, scriptures, as well as a uh, lot of inscriptions, which give us information about its relationship with India and uh, various aspects of Indian cultures depicted in the uh, region of Cambodia. And the most and uh, most glorious period of the history is Angkor period, which starts from 802 AD till around 14th, uh, 14th 15th century, and uh, followed by the decline of Angkor uh, dynasty. So there are few very specific references of temples during this Angkor period. Uh, one of the important references is from Pre Khan temple. And uh, on one of the columns, it is uh, given that the king, uh, Jaivarman VIII, he had a victory over the Shama. Shama is current Thailand. And they um, conquered the Shama dynasty. And henceforth, king founded a city called as uh, Jaya Sri Nagari. Now, it is also depicting the victory of their king. So, Jaya and Sri Nagari. And he compares this city with Prayaga from India and he knows it as a very religiously important city. He also mentions in his uh, inscription that Prayaga has two Tirtha, one is Ganga and one is Yamuna, but he wants to have uh, uh, Jayanagari uh, more advanced in terms of its uh, uh, auspiciousness. So he had three Tirtha instead of two. And then he, he actually started excavation of Jayatataka, which is a Barai, which he constructed, um, a water tank, which he started constructing, which is also known as the um, East Barai. So now uh, he has three Tirtha. One is dedicated to Buddha, second Shiva, and third Vishnu. Now in this inscription, he also mentions uh, the festivals which are supposedly uh, celebrated in this particular temple. And there is an annual festival in the, festival in the month of Falguna, uh, annual assembly, uh, in the month of Chaitra, because that is the start of the year. And how to celebrate these festivals is also written here. So the first festival which was celebrated uh, was with the help of uh, the uh, priest known as Surya Bhatta. And he uh, carried this holy water from all these three Tirtha to the temple along with uh, King of Java and Annama and two rulers from Champa. And he also donated few uh, quantity of rice to this particular temple for the occasion of the uh, festivals. Now, the second eminent uh, uh, inscription that we see is at Tafrom Temple. Now, this temple is culturally as well as uh, socially very important because this is the temple constructed after Angkor Wat Temple. And here we see reference of Gajanta Lakshmi or Gajaraja Lakshmi. And this goddess's reference can be seen here only in this particular temple. And again, this king captured Champa and later on he released the king of Champa. And that's how he uh, had an inscription written over this particular temple. Now here he uh, explains the spring festival to be celebrated over a period of a week and how this uh, there are rules to celebrate this festival. Along with that, this temple is important because it ex gives exact amount of the treasure that this temple has and this kingdom has. So that shows the richness of this particular kingdom as well. Now, the, uh, this particular Bari leaf in Bayon temple, which is again the last uh, capital of Angkor Thom of Khmer region, and that uh, city temple or the capital temple of this particular city was Bayon, and it shows a, a worshipping of goddess here in this particular uh, Bari leaf. So, there is a temple of uh, Lakshmi or a goddess, and then there is a, part, uh, a particular procession going on around the temple. 
Similarly, uh, we also see uh, before Angkor, that is in 10th century, Bentisrei Temple, where uh, we, we can see the most, uh, uh, you know, world-renowned uh, uh, bas-relief or a sculpture of Gajanta Lakshmi, which is one of the best uh, sculptures in the world. And this is, uh, Bantisri is also famous as the jewel of Khmer architecture. So it has a lot of beautiful sculptures and Gajanta Lakshmi is on the entrance of this particular temple. Now, during this period, during Angkor period, we see uh, there are three major deities that they follow. So Shiva, Vishnu and Harihara. And again, with their own consort. So Vishnu with Lakshmi, Shiva with Parvati and Harihara. Angkor region are de dedicated to either Shiva or Vishnu. And sometimes like Bantesrai temple, it is dedicated to both. So half of the plan of the temple is dedicated to Shiva and half of the temple is dedicated to Vishnu. Eventually, during the later part of Angkor period, we see that these temples are just transformed into Buddhist temples. And there is quite a similarity in the iconography of the, uh, uh, the idols of uh, the god gods. And these temples are, uh, for, for them, it is just transition from one god to other. So there is no change of any procession. There is no change in any other ritual that they were following. It is just instead of, say, uh, Vishnu or Shiva, they started following Buddha. And the whole ritual remains same. Again, uh, in Bayon Temple, we find both the images of Lakshmi as well as Buddha. And the procession looks very similar to each other. So there is no difference in the overall conduct of the uh, festival. This is how uh, the uh, current status of the temple uh, look like. So most of this temple have a pediment, which is a yoni pitha of Shivalinga. And then on, the, on that uh, platform, the Buddha statue has been installed. And now most of these temples are worshipped as Buddha temples. In Angkor Wat, there are around 14 inscriptions dated 17th century, which uh, testifies this particular temple, Angkor Wat, which was earlier constructed as a Vishnu temple or Paravishnu Loka. And now it is being transformed into a Buddhist temple. And many Japanese Buddhist pilgrims uh, settled in the vicinity of this temple and they also celebrated the uh, Khmer New Year in, the, in this vicinity. Now, these people explain Angkor Wat temple, uh, which is uh, as per the inscription in the temple, Para Vishnu Loka, they perceived it as Jetavana Garden of Buddha, and they have celebrated many festivals in this in the vicinity of the temple. Now, along with Sanskritization, we also see that the concept of time has also uh, shifted or also transformed from India to Cambodia, and they have followed this concept of time very rigorously. So, uh, the first part of the time is macro time that is the largest uh, span of the time which is yuga so kali yuga dwapara yuga treta and kreta yuga so all these yugas uh, have been uh, religiously followed the second phase of the time is meso time which is manushya varsha or the human scale of time and the third is micro time which is a spiritual experience of time now they know these concepts of time and that's how they have uh, implemented these concepts in the temples as well and various Hindu texts which give the concept of time. And uh, we see the smallest denominator that we currently follow is seconds. But they have gone beyond that and they know exact calculations of time uh, in each year. So there are various um, uh, combinations of time format also. And uh, it seems that Cambodians or the Khmer people knew about this uh, time measurement. Uh, majorly, uh, they followed Shaka era of Indian uh, calendar or Hindu calendar. The first uh, evidence of era that we find is in Indonesia, uh, wherein uh, there is a legend of Hindu arriving with a sage Aji Shaka in 1st century AD, and this year is mentioned at 78 CE, common era. There are various ancient and medieval texts which gives this, uh, uh, this inscription, uh, many uh, you know, uh, references of the years, and the inscriptions always refer to this 78 CE as a uh, benchmarking year. Now, in the mainland of Southeast Asia, we see that the earliest variable, uh, verifiable use of Hindu Shaka methodology uh, in the inscription is marked as Shaka 533, and which is corresponding to the 611 CE that we generally use. And this particular inscription is at Angkor Borai Temple. Now, we see that Hindu calendar system remained popular in this particular region in Southeast Asia through 15th century until date it has been followed in Bali. 
So when we look at the calendar of Hindu uh, calendar system, we have 12 months, Chaitra, Vaisha, Ajeshta, Ashar, Shravan, Bhadra, likewise, which corresponds to these um, uh, English years. And along with that, when we look at the festivals that we celebrate, so the first and very prominent festival is the New Year Festival. And uh, regionally, all across India, more or less, we, uh, we celebrate Chaitra Pratipada as the start of the year. Similarly, uh, we also have a uh, month called Ashwin, wherein we have 15 days dedicated to ancestors. And this is known as Sarvapitri Amavasya or Pitru Paksha. And this festival is very important because we celebrate ancestors during this time. Then we have a Pausha, where we celebrate Bihu, Pongal or Makara Sankranti, Lohuri. Similarly, in Cambodian context, we have a Khmer New Year happening in Chaitra, again on the similar uh, dates as per Hindu calendar and there is a water festival also as part of this particular festival. We have a rice growing season festival happening in Vaishakha and uh, Buddha Purnima happening on the similar date because it is as per the uh, calendar of the Buddha um, uh, enlightenment. So it, it happens on the same day. Uh, the Pitru Paksha in India and uh, the festival of ancestors in Cambodia is in the month of Ashwin. So they again follow a similar timeline. Again, it is of 15 days. And following that, they also have a water and moon festival, which is celebrated over a period of three days. And then there are other festivals like festival of monks and festival, other festivals happening in between. But these are three major festivals that I'm going to elaborate on uh, in today's session. So when we look at parallelly, what is uh, the festivals uh, in India and Cambodia, the um, the Khmer New Year falls on the similar lines of Chaitra Pratipada. Uh, Royal Ploying Day, again, very similar to uh, the Luhuri or the, uh, the, the harvesting season in India. Ancestors Day with Pitru Paksha, uh, Buddha Purnima on the same day. And then Water and Moon Festival with the festivals of Kerala and even uh, Northeast. So these are similarities in between these two festivals and the timelines. So starting with the Khmer New Year, this particular uh, uh, year is known as Chol Cham Thamne and it is celebrated in three parts. So day one is Sankranti, day two is Virat Manabat and third is uh, Virat Kulong Sek. Now these three days are celebrated separately and together they form the Khmer New Year. Now during Angkor period, this festival was supposedly celebrated somewhere during November and then he shifted it by five months because of uh, the harvesting season and it was falling in between the harvesting season so they shifted it so eventually it called into the chaitra month of hindu calendar and currently it is celebrated from since uh, 9th century it has been celebrated as per the hindu calendar so in one of the uh, uh, sculptures in angkor wat we see how this this festival is celebrated so the this is the main temple of uh, deity and these are some uh, some uh, festivities that people carry to the temple. Along with that, there are certain rituals that people follow and some processions which take place during this particular time. So this is what happens till date. So Sankranti, during this time, they have a small uh, uh, idol like uh, a pagoda, which is housed at the, at, at the outside of every house and they, they uh, pray in front of that. After that, they also go for a procession. So there is a huge uh, procession happening on the streets, carrying this smaller uh, pagoda-like structure to the main temple. They also uh, offer a lot of food and different uh, regional varieties to the god and the seniors in the family. This is one of the important um, uh, part of their festival called as Songkran. And it is to pour water on these senior relatives uh, and they... Uh, through this, they take blessings from the seniors to enter to the new year with their blessings. Now, this is very interesting because during Sankranti or the first day of their year, they have Kala Me. This is the local dish or indigenous sweet that they prepare. And it is very similar to what we have in India, uh, uh, the sweet that we prepare during Sankranti. So all across, we use uh, some uh, you know ingredients that are supposedly used during Sankranti and people in Cambodia also use similar kind of ingredients during this festival. Now on second day, uh, they gather at certain, uh, at the local temples and uh, there is a prayer. But along with that, on second day, they have certain traditional games which are played at different locations. 
now uh, there are various traditional games that they play and very uh, significantly these are few uh, very locally known games which uh, you know we also played during our childhood so this is scarf hidden game uh, which people play second is tossing the towel uh, between the uh, male and female uh, population of uh, cambodia and this is the most important part of their festival which is tug of war now this is between two provinces and within the cities also so this becomes the most uh, important uh, event of this khmer new year now it directly relates us to the uh, samudra manthana and it becomes very important part for them because this incidence of samudra manthana plays very important role in khmer life so when we enter the uh, angkor thom or the uh, angkor archaeological park on either side of us we see the samudra manthana uh, statues so on either side we we have devas and asura and in the center we have a mountain so that is the uh, you know very popular kind of a story in cambodia and now it is also part of their festival so through this festival they are still continuing with this particular uh, notion of good and uh, evil and how this uh, whole uh, you know synthesis is happening in life so this is um, very important festival or event during their festival which also has um, local music and local dance happening all across the temples on third day they create uh, this pithi and in this pithi they uh, sometimes they also have some deity or some um, you know the buddha statue uh, which is housed within the pithi now this pithi is like a stupa and they worship this stupa along with that they also uh, 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 sh shower the senior seniors in the house or elders in the house and they uh, seek apologies from them and through that they seek forgiveness and eventually they enter the new year with the blessings from the seniors of the of the family now on third day after this uh, the first segment of the day later part of the day is basically a very similar event like holi so here they uh, have a procession of buddha uh, where community pours water on the buddha image and following this they have this water splashing ceremony uh, within their community and uh, this is uh, done in a very polite and friendly manner and, and they enjoy sankrant through this particular event and this ends their uh, new year uh, with this particular event now in angkor wat temple when we look at khmer new year happening in angkor wat uh, we know that uh, this is the original uh, vishnu statue which is which was earlier at the center of garbhagriha and later on moved to the center second enclosure of the temple now this vishnu is as good as buddha for them so now this particular idol is worshiped as buddha and people worship buddha on this three days so now for three days this whole temple is completely uh, dedicated to all the festivities that are there in the uh, in in this three days uh, one of the first uh, and best known inscription uh, is by marimoto khazufusa he uh, said that he celebrated khmer new year in this particular campus in 1632 now this uh, temple is a largest religious uh, precinct in the world now it is uh, surrounded by a moat and each of the components of this temple starting from this causeway uh, this uh, walkway there is a small platform crucified gallery and then the uh, innermost uh, platforms that are there or the terraces so everything becomes part of the uh, festivities and at every stage there are different uh, ceremonies or different festivities happening uh, throughout the day so this is the entry of the causeway so this is what happens at the entrance uh, on the on the second and third day this is the internal courtyard of the temple or the second parikrama para, second prakara so these are some uh, festivities that they uh, decorate with and uh, the jasmine flower is very important for them during this festival similar to the chaitra uh, mass that is uh, very evident in even maharashtra where jasmine flower plays a very important role so these are certain uh, you know decorations that they do and this is how they worship uh, different deities during this particular time the second important festival is uh, bachum ben which is ancestors day it is actually a 15 day religious festival and on 15th day of the that comes on the 10th uh, month of the khmer calendar and this this whole 15 days became uh, is are very important for them because this is this is believed to be ancestors um, festival 
and they pay respect to the deceased uh, relatives up to seven previous generations. And again, this concept is very similar to what we follow during Pitrupaksha in, in Indian uh, context. Now, during this time, they chant mantra or sutta overnight. So continuously without sleeping, they are supposed to do it. And that's how they propose opening of gates of hell to King Yama. Now, again, going back to Angkor Wat temple, in Angkor Wat, we have a huge panel of around 500 meters of um, Swarga and Naraka. Now, this panel is vertically divided into three levels. So the lower level is Naraka, middle level is Bhumi, and the topmost level is Swarga. And at the center of the panel is Yama. So this is Yama, which is depicted by multiple hands and a bull. So now this particular event is again very important for them because now they are um, uh, preaching King Yama so that he can open the gates and send ancestors back home. Now this uh, festival or this event is presumed to be uh, to occur only once in a year. So this day becomes very important for them. Now, during this festival, the gates of the hell are opened and the spirits of the ancestors are presumed to be especially active. So, in order to liberate them, food offerings are made to benefit them and some of them have opportunity to end their period of purification. So, like uh, in, the, in this bar relief, uh, they have also shown the punishments which are given in the Naraka. So, the good deeds that are done during the Bhumi period or when uh, we are alive, that decides whether we'll go to the uh, Naraka or we'll get elevated to the Swarga. Now, based on the actions or based on the deeds, this will be decided by Yama. And now, this during this period, during these 15 days, Yama would decide or Yama would, uh, you know, elevate people. So, based on the purification which has happened, they will be elevated to Swarga or they will get liberated. So, the people of Cambodia, they believed in believe in both the uh, concept. So the relatives who are in hell, so they will be, uh, uh, you know, they will come back and they will uh, live their life for 15 days in happiness and then again go back to the uh, Naraka for further suffering. And the ancestors who are in heaven, now they will get, uh, you know, they will also benefit from these ceremonies. So that is how they believe in this particular ceremony and that's why this became, uh, eventually became very important festival. Now, this festival started somewhere in 889 AD, uh, wherein Yasho Varmana, he ordered to hold this festival in Yashodhara Tataka. Now, Yashodhara Tataka is East Barai, uh, this huge water body, which is again a um, handmade water tank constructed during Yashodhara, uh, Yasho Varmana. And he ordered to uh, have this festival because he wanted to gather merit for those who died of the misfortune to be reborn. So rebirth is always seen as a uh, you know negative uh, aspect of uh, afterlife. So uh, this this has been seen as a very important festival throughout the history of Angkor, and this festival used to be known as uh, Srath festival, as per the inscription. Now the third and uh, last and very important uh, long festival in Cambodia is Water and Moon festival. Uh, it is also known as Bom uh, Bon on Tuk uh, Bonded Protit and Sampre Prikhe. Now, this is again a three-day festival. It falls in Shukla Paksha of Kadek month, that is Kartika of Hindu calendar. And in Khmer, it is Kadek. It happens on Chaturdashi, that is 14th and 15th day of Shukla Paksha and first day of Krishna Paksha, that is Pratipada. So, these three days is a transition time uh, during which this water festival and moon festivals are celebrated. Now, this festival is very popular in Cambodia because all across uh, Bayon Temple, we see all this, all the bar reliefs dedicated to boat racing festival and the uh, wars happening overseas. So, this becomes a very important e event of uh, the history of Cambodia also. And through that, this festival was emerged as part of their uh, uh, political event. So this uh, dates back to 12th century and was originally held uh, to honor the Jayavarmana Seven and his maritime uh, marine army who defeated Sham people. And uh, this festival was started because of that particular victory. Now there is another ecological reason also. Now Cambodian people know about India very well. They also know about Prayaga and other cities in India which are religiously important. And now here they also know that there are five rivers from Himalaya, which spread across India to Cambodia. So the first river becomes Brahmaputra and the last river becomes Mekong. And Mekong enters Cambodia and then it goes to Vietnam and then it meets sea. Now this 
composition of Mekong River also makes Cambodia very uh, fertile land. Also because it gives a very huge lake known as Stonele Sap Lake, which is the third largest lake in the world. And uh, the, uh, uh, the survival of this region completely depends on Tonle Sap and Mekong River. Now, uh, during, the, uh, during the wet season, uh, the water accumulates in the Tonle Sap River. And during the later part of the season, this Tonle Sap also fills Mekong River, which goes to uh, Vietnam. So this becomes lifeline for both Vietnam as well as uh, Cambodia. Now, Mekong River is uh, historically in inscription, it is written as Man Ganga. Uh, that means Mother Ganga. And they know that Ganga is one of the longest rivers in the world. Now, they also mention that it is the longest flowing river. And similarly, we also have a longest flowing river is Mekong. So that's how they depict Mekong as the Ganga of Cambodia. And this river and its tributaries uh, are the main source of prosperity of Cambodia. So to pay, pay tribute to these rivers and to pay tribute to this uh, particular, uh, you know, uh, Ganga of Cambodia, this particular festival has been celebrated. Now, this is again a three-day festival and all three days they have a boat racing. And again, there are male and female racing boats which are um, floated all across Tonle Sap as well as Mekong River. Now, earlier this festival used to be in the uh, Barai. So, West and East Barai were used as a fest, uh, fest, uh, you know, the festival uh, lakes. But eventually, it was shifted to the Tonle Sap and the Mekong River. Now, these two uh, uh, days, the first and the second day, are dedicated to God of River and God of Earth uh, for the joyfulness and fruitfulness. Now, uh, very importantly, the whole economy of Cambodia since the earliest days is dependent on the farming and uh, uh, the farmland and the very uh, fertile land that they have. So, because of that, their complete dependency is on these, um, uh, you know, sources of income, and that's how these natural elements have gained very important, uh, very much importance in their history, and then it it is transferred to the uh, festivities uh, over a period of year. Now, this particular festival on the evening during day they have a boat racing, and during evening they have this uh, uh, illumination of the boats and illumination of the uh, coast area. And uh, each of the ministry that they have, they float a boat on a particular day and they project their, uh, uh, to re their ministry through this illumination. Now, towards the midnight, they also celebrate uh, the midnight uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, festivities. And during this time, they pay homage to the uh, river. And after that, they go to the nearest temple wherein they have an egg embok uh, named uh, indigenous dish, which has been distributed. Now, this dish is very important. So they have to consume that particular sweet uh, on that particular night. And that is why every house or every temple distributes these sweets during this particular festival on, in the midnight. So these three water sources or the, these three huge water bodies are important along with those uh, Tonle Sap and Mekong River, wherein all these festivities happen. All these green areas that we see here are basically the festival uh, or the ritual grounds, which are being provided while these temples were constructed. Now, when we look at Angkor Wat Temple, we clearly understand that these spaces were, uh, were you know, designed or uh, organized in a way that the festivities could happen and the procession could take uh, uh, its space within the pra pra prakara of the temple. So these are the galleries which are uh, there, which can overlook the procession happening in the open area of the temple. Now, when we look at the festivals of Brihadeshwara temple in comparison to these, uh, you know, Cambodian festivals, there are, um, these are the Tamil months that uh, we follow all across 12 months, again, following the similar pattern of Chaitra Vaishakha. And the important festivals are, uh, because it is a Shiva temple, there are uh, festivals dedicated to Shiva. However, we also see that uh, Shatabisha is the, is the important, uh, you know, festival for them and which happens every month. So every month, Shivratri becomes very important and this nakshatra uh, which is also the nakshatra of the Raja Raja Chola's birth time. And that particular time is important for the Abhishekham. So this Abhishekham happens every month. Apart from uh, that, uh, Tiru Vadharai is an important auspicious star of Lord Shiva. And this is very important in terms of the Shaivism uh, rituals also. And that's why the Abhishekham happens during that particular time. Now, going beyond this uh, temple, of Brihadeshwara is an important venue or important space for having annual festivals 
uh, which is a nine day long festival happening during Vaishakha. Again, uh, it falls during the similar timeline of Chaitra and Vaishakha and the transition of Chaitra Vaishakha as per Hindu calendar. And here they uh, uh, take bath in the, uh, you know, the deity has to be uh, washed with a champa flower uh, pregnant water. And uh, there are certain occasional festivals like this is Kumbha, Kumbha Bhi Shekam, which happens uh, after every 12 years. And it started by Raja Raja Chola. And eventually it, it, uh, it is happening since last thousand years, every, after every 12 years. This is uh, Dvajadanda, which is at the entry of the uh, Brihadeshwara temple. And this is the start of Chirithai temp uh, procession, which starts from here. So the chariot also starts from this particular place where this uh, particular flag is being hoisted. And then the procession uh, happens in the vicinity of the temple and goes out to the city of Tanjavur. Uh, Ipasi is, is Ashwin month, which is between October and November. And it is regarded as a very auspicious month. So during this time, there is a lot of Annadanam and uh, Thulusnanam. And this particular uh, temple becomes a huge gathering space during all these festivities. So when we look at uh, the way we looked at Angkor Wat, when we look at Brihadeshwara temple, the prakara of the temple becomes a gathering space. And then there are, uh, this is the Dvajastamba, the, where the flag is being hosted be before the uh, chariot festival so that uh, the god himself comes out of the temple and then he takes parikrama and goes out to the city of Tanjavur. Uh, similarly, other festivals happen here. So this is the Nandi Mandapa. So in between Nandi Mandapa and the uh, Mukha Mandapa, the space between uh, those two structures is also used for the uh, festival during Kumbha, Kumbha Bishekam and the Annadanam. So these are different spaces which can, which are generally used for the public gatherings. But the internal spaces of the temple, like in case of Angkor Wat, the innermost prakara is used by the royal family during this festival. Similarly, the Garbhagriha is only accessed by the, uh, the uh, important people of the society. So when we compare both these uh, festivities and their way of uh, celebrating festival, uh, we understand that India and Cambodia share an intellectual wealth, such as folklore, customs, belief, traditions, knowledge, languages for ages. Uh, intangible cultural heritage, when we talk about it, it in encompasses the practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, skills, instruments, objects, artifacts, cultural spaces associated therewith, uh, and that communities contribute towards cultural heritage. Now, Cambodia has been an extension of Indian intangible culture as well, which is then manifested in various tangible formats. And that is how we see these temples uh, constructed all across Cambodia uh, in a very Indian format. While working on cultural tourism modules of Cambodia, where the visitors are encouraged to learn, discover, experience, and consume the tangible and intangible cultural attractions, it is imperative to look at the historical and cultural references where the roots of this culture lie. And uh, with this, uh, I would like to say that when we look at Cambodia, the Indian references are very important. But when we uh, you know, visit Cambodia, there is a lot of disconnect that is happening because of the influences of different countries and development models. And that's how this connection is getting lost. So when we see the Cambodian, uh, you know, tourism or the Cambodian uh, way of promoting tourism, there is a lot of uh, disconnect between the Indian history or the transition of history from India to Cambodia. And this, that disconnect is actually reflecting into their various policies that they implement to promote their tourism. Thank you. Thank you, Ujwala. It was a visual treat. I mean, you practically took us to Cambodia for, for a second. I was really spellbound. So thank you once again very much for the wonderful talk. I uh, would uh, now request uh, our other scholars to come forward. Uh, Dr. Mranalini Atri. Uh, Dr. Manalini, uh, she has a doctorate in history. She works as a lecturer at the law school, University of Jammu, Jammu in India. And her research work is largely focused on the local deity, cult, folk rituals, folk narrative songs, and women's role in the transmission and the recreation of intangible cultural mm -hmm. heritage. Manalini coordinates, she coordinates the ACHS, Association of Cult, Critical Heritage Studies, India Chapter, and the National Scientific Committee on Intangible Cultural Heritage, ICOMAS India. 
thank you very much, Manalni, for being here with us. And we have been listening to beautiful uh, scholars from your team. So it's we are happy to have you here, please. Thank, thank you, Patuji. First of all, I would like to thank uh, which was I thought it, it was a wonderful presentation and uh, being a student of history it was really good to know because there are certain things we uh, as students we learn that we have the, the extension of Indian culture in Cambodia and uh, other Southeast Asian countries but the way you have detailed the each nuances of the festivals which are celebrated there it was really uh, knowledgeable thank you Uchula. Now, we have been uh, organizing this webinar. This is the second season which Madhu has taken the initiative. And uh, here we, it was a collaboration between uh, cultural tourism and HTV and ICH. So basically the idea was to bring in these three uh, committees to collaborate and connect the dots because when we talk about uh, responsible tourism, the tourism does not happen in a vacuum. So there has, there have to be some space and how those spaces, the cultural spaces have to be protected because of the on indiscriminate uh, tourism, which is happening nowadays. So in to look at all these things, we started with these webinars and the, these, uh, starting, I think it was from 13th of May that we had four webinars and this last one where we took the discourse outside India and Ujwala made a presentation on Cambodia and its temples and festivals, how these festivals are going on and what is the transformation which has happened. Like she talked about how the Vishnu and Shiv temples have been transformed into the Buddhist temples. Now, these festivals are a beautiful blend of tangible and intangible heritage, and it needs protection. We all know that, that these, this both tangible and intangible aspect has to be protected from the onslaught of not only globalization, but also the indiscriminate development of tourism industry. But it is the uh, heritage experts and the government institutions we need to decide where we need to stop. Are we going to lay bare sensitive heritage to tourism industry without any measures for its production? How do we integrate sustainable development? We have been talking about it in every discourse, and wherever the dialogue is happening on heritage, we talk about sustainable development. But how we do we integrate sustainable development with responsible tourism? We need to think about the local communities as well. And how do we assist them to safeguard their intangible heritage, the traditions, the festivals within the personnets of a historic area? Because this historic area is being visited by numerous tourists. What is the impact of the tourist, tourists on the, in such areas? And then these festivals, they are also a source of livelihood for these indigenous people or the local communities. With these dots in mind, these webinars have been curated by the Cultural Tourism Committee in collaboration with HTV and ICH. And if we look at the four, last four webinars, which have been there, we first of all looked into the typologies. And the typologies which have emerged is that of some festivals which are lesser known, festivals which are celebrated across India, and then there were some festivals which are both celebrated in urban and rural areas, like Durga Puja, which, which is not limited to a particular city, but it extends beyond that city and into the rural areas. Then we have, and it can be called the festival of masses. We have deity related festivals. We have agrarian based festivals like from Northeast Bihu festival. Then there are some festivals which are related or connected with Buddhist cultural tourism. There are some festivals which, especially in Chaitra and uh, Sharad Navratras, take place at Shakti Peaks. Then there are celebrations of folk deity 
uh, festivals. Like in Jammu, we have a festival which is known as Baba Jito Festival, which takes place in Kartik month and it extends over uh, one week. And the people who visit this, their number is more than seven lakh. So within one week, seven lakh people visit that. Though they, the people who visit there is the people who have Baba Jito as their deity. But still, that is a uh, festival which is uh, organized at an extensive level. Then there are some festivals which are associated with historic towns. And each of this typology shows us that they have their own distinct nuances. And this can help us to develop a framework for future. Uh, that it, it can be a way forward that how we document all these festivals and the typologies, and they can help us to understand how these festivals happen at a particular place, and they can help us to safeguard this heritage. Uh, in the last webinar which we had, it, uh, there was one presentation related to women and their association with the festivals. Now this theme also needs to be developed further because it cannot be denied that women are the inventors of the most fundamental aspects of our life and culture, be it rituals, ceremonies, arts, crafts, culinary skills, collective memory, or you can say the, all that constitutes uh, traditional knowledge. And we cannot forget that she is the tradition bearer, but what is the extent of her participation? How, we need to look at the part that women play in rituals and festivals. If I talk about Jammu region, because that's the area where I'm working, the study shows that within the domestic sphere, it is the women who leads the festivals or rituals. But if you talk about the public domain, that it is the male dominated. If we take the example of Nag worship. So in Jammu region, women are prohibited of for performing any ritual at the play at the place where you have the Nag deities. But at the same time, whenever there is a Nag Panchami, the women, they have to perform the things within the home. So Nag worship is prohibited to women so far as public domain is concerned. So we need to look at all these things because as, apart from being a source of identity, these festivals can also help us to build the narratives of the communities who observe them especially in the case where we have less of the conventional sources, the, the tribals, the women. Then another area is that how much role presently in present context, the women is playing in safeguarding this heritage. What is the extent of her participation? Then the other area which can be uh, further discussed and that is the extent of transformation which these festivals have undergone. What is the reason for this transformation if there is any? The factor is responsible. And then how much of to, the role has been played by tourism in this bringing this transformation? Because if you visit the festivals, uh, the traditional festivals, they have undergone a lot of changes. Earlier they used to uh, sell the things which were village made handicrafts but now if you go to these melas and the festivals the the items used there is now different so how this transmission has gone and who who is bringing this trans the role of the local community and the extent of this intervention from outside in the performance of the festival. Uh, if I come to the last presentation, that is Uchwala's presentation, that was again an attempt to connect the dots outside of South Asia, where Indian culture and festival have had strong hold. This would help us to understand the transformation of the festivals in an outside territory. The Indian festivals, how they have undergone a transformation, like she pointed out, the transformation from Shiv Vishnu temples to those of Buddhism and also look into the ways such festivals have been preserved in those areas.
and the transformation which has happened. Our comparison of Bhideshwar and Angkor Temple with the associated festivals, they can help us to understand a lot about the beliefs and rituals of, of the people in the both the areas. Thank you. Thank you, Varnalini, for your thoughtful words. I would uh, now request Dr. Niyati Jigyasu to come forward. Niyati is an architect and an academician with more than 22 years of experience. Her research work examines the interlinkages and intersections between tangible and intangible attributes in historic areas. She has been involved in various capacities for project that is international and national projects. They include uh, resource, she, she she has worked as a resource person at the UNESCO sub-regional inception workshop, linking world heritage sites and local cultural assets. This workshop was held in Malaysia in 2018. Niyati is iCommerce India, a national scientific coordinator for historic town, cities, and villages. Welcome, Niyati. Yeah, thank you so much, Madhuji. And uh, thank you so much to all the... Can I be heard well? Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, okay. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much. And thank you to all the contributors for their case studies, but, uh, because it was quite a interesting month to look at you know, the spread of India and our intangible cultural heritage. I, I don't think these are the only examples, but yeah, uh, they were like some of them which were which ICOMOS members could uh, you know contribute to. And uh, uh, Dr. Ujwala, uh, I think it was a fantastic presentation and uh, it was very interesting uh, because I think we all know about, you know, that we do have parallels in history with Cambodia and the other countries. Like even this Malaysia, when I went, I had a lot of people who were Tamil who had come from maybe generations before and they were living here and uh, so and they had all their uh, documentation that they had done about their you know heritage in Malaysia and which were actually the original Tamil thing. so uh, but actually looking at very specific rituals and practices uh, including you know the holy the water and also the dia on the water the boat uh, races uh, it was very interesting to see, you know, that there are actually there are these things which are quite similar and still different. And uh, so thank you so much. And I think uh, also uh, your presentation uh, talked about how, you know, spaces are used in the sense of when they had these, um, when the people get together for processions, whether it is for tug of war, also the other attributes, uh, even the natural attributes like the river, how it is used for these festivals. So uh, when we talk about festivals, I think it's not only about, you know, uh, just the idol and some rituals, it's actually about the entire environment which it takes up. And the uh, people within the uh, built fabric within. So coming from a historic uh, cities, towns and, uh, you know, villages uh, committee, my role today was basically to look into or position uh, festivals within the historic areas. And that's what I'm going to do by just trying to talk about three small uh, examples and just very briefly, so not uh, elaborate on them, but they do have parallels with people who have already presented before. And uh, so, uh, like, I would start by taking a line from Rahul Merhotra's paper, you know, which uh, I find very perfect for to position intangible cultural heritage in historic cities and towns. He says that architecture cannot remain the spectacle of the city, nor does it comprise one dominant image of the city. In this context, he describes the Ganesha temple uh, festival. We all know the Ganesha festival, most celebrated in Maharashtra and Gujarat. It involves big and small idols put up in pandals with the entire community involved. Other than the worship part, it also brings in other things, you know, including food management of crowd, uh, the processions, uh, the dance, the drama. The city municipality also gets involved in the management and the infrastructure. On the 10th day, the Ganesha is taken through the lanes, the routes which have been decided either due to the resident community or traffic regulations of the city with a lot of pomp and submerged in the water body. People get together to visit the place and take part in the procession. The presentation is also used 
to make a political statement or showcase a world level issue like climate change. From earlier being just a ritual for worship, they have today become platforms to showcase art, prosperity, politics, and much more. This has many parallels with the Durga Puja festival as talked about by architect Maitra. This makes the image of the town or the city. These kinetic images made by the festival, they add identity to the place. The spaces are consumed and reinterpreted, given a temporal meaning as against the static environment. As architect Maitra also mentioned, temporary architecture and the process of transformation of the city, which goes around this 10 days and then it gets back to you know, the uh, static environment, which was there earlier. Similarly, there is a festival of Langur Mela in Amritsar, which was one of my case study. So this is a, uh, Langur is a typology of monkey, you know, most uh, like people would know. And uh, he's associated to Lord Hanuman. So this is a very popular festival in Amritsar, which is associated with the temple of Bada Hanuman. The festival involves hundreds of children dressed as Hanuman, taking part in a procession on the streets on the, in the historic lanes. As per historical accounts, this century-old tradition is based on the belief that those couples who desire a male child can get their wish fulfilled by praying at the temple. And if their wishes are granted, they dress up their boys as langurs, a typology of a monkey, and come to the, be blessed by Lord Hanuman at the temple. This is organized in form of small and large processions, accompanied by family members, friends, neighbors, musicians, beginning from the homes, along the lanes of the city and ending at the temple. People believe that bringing their sons during the Navratri will get Lord Hanuman's uh, blessings for all their endeavors throughout their life. The children and their parents also must follow a celibate life for 10 days, remain bare feet, eat sattvic food, sleep on the floor and pray to the Lord. The temple is also significant because of being one of the only three temples in the country to have Lord Hanuman in the resting state. According to the legend, goddess Sita and her sons, Love and Kush, lived in this, this place during her exile. The Ramayana mentions Love and Kush tying Lord Hanuman to a tree when he arrived to take them back to Ayodhya. This tree is believed to be inside the temple premises and preserved by the temple management. All these legends add to the popularity of the festival and lure many tourists here. So though these festivals start off as a culture of you know, certain communities or you know, certain caste, sometimes it is only certain caste who actually celebrates it, it ultimately becomes a, a you know, part of the uh, city for everybody. Like even the Ganesha festival, even though it was supposed to be for the Maharashtrians, uh, in Gujarat nowadays, it's like everybody does it. You know? So it has actually become a part of that other state also, and they embrace it full, wholeheartedly. Uh, Roshni uh, also talked about, you know, the similar, the thing where she talks about in that urban area where she said that the tour this kind of tourism are also most common and popular in countries such as ours. Like even this Langur festival, I actually uh, first found its mention from something called uh, pedals, tourists on pedals. So there was some website by some foreigner who had, you know, put it up and she had, so it actually becomes popular with a lot of people because of the different, the uh, you know, uh, interest. So all festivals draw on a specific cultural background of accumulated cultural capital. They bring together, display, and reinterpret a cultural legacy inseparably linked to intangible elements in terms of collective recognition of identity, the passing on of rituals and customs, or even the individual assertion of social identity. Within the historic cities, they are associated with the built fabric, the resident community, and the history over the decades and are as much part of the identity of the place. They form the spirit of the town, the architectural fabric contained within the city or the town, whether they are the reason for the festival, such as the Hanuman temple in Amritsar, or part of a backdrop for a pandal or a procession, including uh, something like, you know, Hawa Mahal, because some people, uh, you know, it, as it is said, that Hawa Mahal was supposed to be for the royal ladies to see the daily activities as well as a festival. So it actually is one of the saying that goes with that. So uh, basically, the it, uh, festivals it foster economic development and social cohesion in a changing global environment. The historic urban landscape approach also discusses the preservation of this very quality of human environment for its long-term sustainability. 
These festivals bring about cultural diversity and creativity as key assets for human, social, and economic development, enhancing the community's sense of identity and belonging. Such, as, such events can contribute to many SDG goals, including Target 8.3, which talks about jobs, innovations, Target 6.7, participatory decision, decision making, Target 12, which talks about sustainable tourism management, among many others. I would now just uh, take a short example of uh, you know, the Kum Mela, which is a very different uh, type of association that we have with the, you know, the built uh, environment. So as we all know, this festival involves a congregation of millions of people at Haridwar on the confluence of the rivers Ganga and Yamuna. It involves 7 million people living for 55 days and another 100 million visiting. So this is an establishment of a mega city, but a temporary city for a duration of one to three months. The most significant ritual includes the bath for the soul cleansing. Other rich events include religious assemblies, devotional singing, mass feeding, and debates on sacred doctrines, satsangs. An essential part of the Mahakumbh is of the devotees sitting for hours, listening to the hymns and discourses on Hinduism for disseminating knowledge about the religion. So for this event to take place within the period of three months, from 15th October to 15th January, a city is set up on the proper urban grid, made up of tents for 1 million people who are going to stay there, a 100-bed hospital, police stations, services, infrastructure, which includes electricity, several system, and a lot more. Security systems also included. Depending on the terrain of the, uh, the river, the city planning is laid out, and it also gets adjusted. As a regular city, the city also has this physical as well as social infrastructure. The festival takes place for three months, and in the span of some days, the whole place is dismantled, and you see just the river with the water coming to the place where the living city existed. So this is an amazing example of how a tangible environment of a large scale is actually created for giving space to an intangible aspect of faith, spirit, and devotion. And it's also sustainable in the sense that, you know, the city comes up, uh, the whole festival happens, and then it again goes back to, uh, goes back to the river. Of course, there are a lot of uh, side uh, issues also with, uh, with it, but I'm not going to get into that for now. So the, the important part about uh, what I was trying to put down was basically looking at that, you know, when we are so talking about historic urban areas and, you know, management of historic urban areas, I think it is very important to see that all these festivals and other things, they have to be part of that management policies. Like they can't be taken as separately or they can't be taken as something which happens at certain time and they won't be there later on. So they will always have to be, you know, that the uh, entire my uh, talk about my thesis and other things, they always talk about that basically trying to put the entire thing into one perspective and talk about integrated comprehensive understanding of looking at how both of these intersect together, they associate together, whether it is because of certain, uh, just as a backdrop also, or it, it is because they are part of that entire festival, like the temp different kind of temples. There are also a lot of trees which are part of uh, places in urban areas. So, uh, and also the lanes, because all these lanes have a lot of history behind them. So, uh, like people, when they told me that, you know, when this Langur Mela, because the neighbor had done and they had participated in that procession, now when their neighbor is going to do, they are going to participate in. So it becomes like a chain, you know, and then because in Gujarat, because somebody has a Ganpati at home, the others have to go and visit that house. And so then there is a big occasion and every day, you know, it's a celebration. So. All these things, you know, it just brings everybody together in a sense. So it's not only about a uh, festival, but it is about so many things which get uh, interlinked together, which I think Dr. Ujwala brought out very well in her uh, presentation, you know, where, and she also talked about what was there in those, uh, the idols, which was already depicted earlier, on, uh, earlier also, and what we see today also. So, yeah, I think that was, uh, it was a amazing one month. And we look forward to season three. And thank you so much, Madhuji. And thank you, Dr. Ijula. Thank you. Thank you, Niyati Mel. So moving on to the next segment of uh, this uh, series, I would like to invite uh, uh, architect Madhu Votari. 
She is the coordinator for National Scientific Committee Cultural Tourism. She is an expert member of uh, the Cultural Tourism ISC and author and conservation architect. In her 20 years of rich experience uh, with international uh, organizations like UNESCO and WMF and national projects, she has received awards, a national scholarship, a fellowship, and an exchange program with IVLP USA 2012. Madhu is a pride of Telangana 2021 for her love to work with schools and college students. Over to you, Madhu. Thank you, Jula. And uh, thanks to Nitin Mranani for uh, being the co-panelist today. So yeah, now the time is to close the event. So I would once again thank all the wonderful speakers and the audience and the senior ICOMERS members who have been part of the project and the support, I would say, for us, our co-coordinator, Roshni and Shri Amai. Now, coming to packing up, I think already Manalini and Niyati has given a detailed review of what our speakers have been telling. And, uh, you know, the responsible tourism angle, Madhura has already started with that in the first part. So I would say that as an individual, as a visitor, as a tourist, as an accommodation, we must focus on the sensitivity towards the environment where Niyati was saying that she cannot get into the details of, you know, how we end up sometime consciously or unconsciously polluting the lakes or rivers. So whichever community we belong to, our stress should be, let the festivals survive and thrive. Let the people enjoy. Let us have more tourism connected to the festival. That's what the cultural tourism is all about. Yet at the same time, not at the cost of environment. I would also say that whenever we think about the road widening, whenever we think about increasing more areas, the stress should still be on the environment because we are because of the environment, not the other way around. And uh, yeah, and I would also like to quote what me and Madhura were discussing. Uh, this is about, uh, you know, the answers are coming from Mondia Cult 2022, the latest convention. Uh, the culture has a, a fundamental role in our society. We all understand that. So cultural does culture does deserve its place in public policies and international cooperation. This is what we are trying to say. Like you have already proved that you're going all the way to Cambodia, Bali, and then we are looking back and saying that, okay, this is all it all, it all started from within India. Also, we have seen that North and South of the country has similar uh, tradition and similar calendar festival we are following. So yeah, with this, I would like to close and uh, let's hope that we do more good work together and uh, we influence more people, let our tribe grow. Once again, thank you very much for all the love and cooperation. Thank you, Jewel. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Any questions, maybe we are here to answer or we close the meeting. Roshni, do you see some questions? No, ma'am, I think uh, it was already answered. Uh, Kiran, ma'am had a question. Dr. Ujwal already answered it. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you.